Modern with Rabbi Mark Angel. Just a reminder and welcome you all again. Um, as of any of you know, this is a part of our new Sephardic Digital Academy initiative through the Sephardic Jewish Brotherhood of America, the national umbrella organization for the Sephardic Ladino speaking Jews from the former Ottoman Empire who live in the United States and across the country. And we also collaborate with communities around the world as well. We're so excited to have Rabbi Mark Angel, a disciple from one of our many communities in Seattle, a beautiful Buddhist Lee in Turkish background, um, with us here tonight. We'll be talking about one of his uh, many books in this four part series, particularly focusing on Sephardic history and heritage. A man obviously also needs a Chacham who needs uh, no introduction as well, um, who is the, um, the Rabbi Emeritus of uh, the Congregation Sheriff Israel in New York, as well as the director of the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals. Rabbi Angel, whenever you're ready, Bechavod. Okay, good evening, everybody. Can you all hear me? Yes, we're on. Okay. Good evening, wish you all good health and happiness and uh, all good things for everybody. We're living in a difficult time of COVID crisis. So Baruch Hashem, we have what advantage? We have Zoom. So we're able to have classes and able to have conversations, even though we can't necessarily get together in, per in person. Uh, years and years ago, I was, was contemplating the following dilemma. Last week, we discussed the decline spiritual decline, cultural decline of the Sephardim in the Ottoman Empire, especially following in the, in the 1800s, 1700s, 1800s, the economic decline, the intellectual decline, the cultural decline, how Sephardim in general became passive, uh, high levels of poverty, the educational level went down. There was always an elite, an intellectual elite, there was a financial elite, but the masses of people gradually sank into a very, we'd call a low level of cultural, religious, spiritual life. They were more or less struggling just to make a living, trying to keep body and soul together. Nevertheless, I grew up among people who came from that background. Um, my grandparents came to Seattle from Turkey and from the island of Rhodes. And I had the privilege of knowing a lot of people from that generation of the early 1900s um, who came early to the United States. And I noticed the following thing, many of them, in fact, most of them came with very little formal education, no money to speak of. They came with hope. They didn't know the English language. They didn't know where they were coming, really. But one thing I noticed, especially in my grandparents, but in my uncles and aunts and others as well, they knew who they were. They were very sturdy, very strong, very self-assured. They were princes. They felt very good about themselves. I was trying to figure out how could it be that these people who come to the United States, they come as immigrants, they come poor, they come without much formal education, and yet they didn't feel inferior, they didn't feel there was anything wrong with them. On the contrary, they felt very confident that they were going to be able to succeed and raise their children and grandchildren, et cetera, et cetera. And I'd like to start with a little anecdote that affected me personally. My grandfather, my mother's father's name was Marco Romi, Mordechai Romi. I'm second born boy in my family, so my name is Mark, Marco Mordechai, I'm named after my grandfather Romi. And my grandfather Romi was a, a great role model for me. Uh, as I said before, he was a sturdy, strong, handsome, a prince of a man, but without much education. And he was very poor. They had seven children, him and my grandmother had seven children. My mother was a second born and they, they got through life. Uh, they managed to get through life, but on a very simple level. My grandfather was a barber. He started off as a longshore man and he then graduated to a fancier job. He was a barber. His greatest achievement in life was he was the barber of Senator Warner Magnuson, the Senator, the United States Senator from the state of Washington. Whenever the Senator came to Seattle and he went to the Union Hall where my grandfather had his barber shop, the senator got a haircut from Marco Romi. That was my grandfather's greatest achievement. Okay. I'm a little boy going to the Seattle Hebrew School and the Hebrew teacher asks all of the students, please tell us what tribe you're from. Are you Kohen, Levi, Israel? So I come home and I ask my mother, mom, what tribe are we from? My mom says, I don't know, ask Papu. We call my grandfather Papu. I call up Papu, Papu, what, grand, what tribe are we from? We're from the tribe of Yehuda. Okay, next day I go to school 
And the teacher asks this one, you're, who are you, Kohen? You are Levi, you Israel. Angel, who are you? Yehuda. The teacher, you, that's, not, that's not one of the choices. <laughs> you had a choice of being Kohen, Yisrael, Levi. Yehuda is not a choice. I said, but I asked my grandfather, and my grandfather told me, we're from the tribe of Yehuda. So the teacher says, your grandfather's an ignorant man. You tell a child that. As I was crying, I felt very bad. I came home and I told my mom. My mom says, call up Papu. So I called up Papu. I said, Papu, I went to school today and I said I was from the tribe of Yehuda and the teacher didn't believe me. My grandfather says, you know what? Your teacher is an ignorant man. We are from the tribe of Yehuda. The aristocracy of the, of the Jews in Judea in ancient times, they were taken to Spain. And we are from those people. We're from the aristocracy of the Jewish people. We're from the tribe of Yehuda. I found out later that that was fairly common belief among many Sephardim. I don't know if it's historically true. I'm not even gonna argue if it's true or false. I know one thing, for my grandfather it was absolutely true. He was a prince of Israel. He was aristocracy. He was a barber, he was poor. He was mo very modestly educated, mostly by himself. But in his own eyes, he was somebody. In his own eyes, he re represented something. I wondered how could it be that after all those centuries of more or less living on a low level, just relatively speaking, how did these Sephardim maintain this inner strength? What was their inner life? What gave them that poise? So one aspect is, yes, they had this vision that they were from aristocracy, they were nobility. Sephardim tended to be, of course, not anymore, but in those days tended to be stubborn, proud, and uh, very keen on kavod, their own honor. Um, what, where did it all come from? So I did a lot of study, a lot of research, and the more I thought about it, the more I realized that there are certain key elements within the Sephardic tradition, both the folk tradition and the intellectual tradition that contributed towards developing a kind of person, a personality. And those things which are in the tradition are very powerful and meaningful to us. And I think they'll be meaningful uh, for generations to come if we pay attention to what they were. I'm going to give several examples of what I'm talking about. One quality which I just touched on with my grandfather, I call interiority or inwardness. I spoke about this actually earlier at the Conforad conference. Which is, I see Mr. Ben O'Leal is on the machine here today, and he runs a wonderful conference uh, for the Jews of South America and Central, who, who Portuguese and Spanish speaking Jews. And some of the stuff I'm saying tonight, I already said this afternoon in that talk. But one of the things I want to talk about is interiority. Interiority means in order for us to be strong people, we have to know who we are. We have to have confidence in who we are. We can't define ourselves by how other people define us. We have to be able to define ourselves by our own standards. And we don't have to chase after, after everybody. We don't have to say we're as rich as they are, we're smart as they are, we have more degrees, more honors. That's not the point. What is the real point? The point is, if I'm strong to myself, and I know who I am, and I'm answerable to the Almighty, not to any human being, then I'm going to be able to live a strong, happy, and good life. So, for example, in the, um, in the Mayabloes, which we discussed a little bit last week, which is Ladino Bible commentary, Rabbi Yaakov Huli draws different midrashim, different rabbinic teachings, that if you look at all of them combined, it shows a tremendous reverence for the common man respect for the so-called common man. And I'm gonna talk about one Midrash right now. The one Midrash that I wanna talk about was when the Israelites received the 10 commandments the first time. You remember it was a big show. They even made a movie about it. All the Israelites are circling around Mount Sinai. There's thunder, there's lightning, there's a the sound of the shofar. It's an amazing event. Moshe Rabbein is on top of the mountain and God's voice comes out. I am the Lord your God. And Moshe Rabbeinu gets these wonderful 10 commandments. But what happens to those Ten Commandments? What happens is when he walks down the mountain, he sees the people of Israel worshiping the golden calf. And what does he do with those Ten Commandments? He throws them on the ground, they smash it in bits. Terrible. Okay. So Moshe Rabbeinu punishes the sinners, and then he wants to get atonement for the people. So he asks for atonement. He asks for God to forgive the people. And God says, okay, I'll give you a second chance. Moshe, you go up the mountain again. But this time, this time, Moshe, you're going to carve out those two tablets of law yourself. So this time, Moshe Rabbeinu went to the top of the mountain. 
he's all alone. There's no shofar, there's no thunder, there's no lightning, there's no voice of God uh, shaking the whole universe. Moshe Rabbeinu, by the sweat of his own brow, is carving out these stones. What happens to these stones? Moshe Rabbeinu brings them down and puts them in the ark, and this becomes a spiritual foundation of the Jewish people, the people of Israel. Says the Ma'am Loez, what does this teach us? Sometimes people think if there's a lot of glitz, a lot of fanfare, a lot of commotion, that's what lasts. No. What's important in life isn't the fancy and the commotion and the lights and the publicity and the, the sound of the shofar and miracles. That's not important. What's important? What a person does on top of the mountain, all alone. Nobody watching, no one cheering. People might remember, might not remember. Doesn't matter. Moshe Rabbeinu working alone by the sweat of his own brow, that's what's lasting. And the ultimate lesson is that's what's lasting to us also. Sometimes people say, well, this one's this is the president of this, this one's famous for this, this one is, has, has a billion dollars, and this one has a, a Rolls Royce, and this one has this. You know what? Let them all live and be well. Not my problem. What's my problem? I'm on top of my own mountain. I'm alone. I have to do my thing. I have to, by the sweat of my own brow, I have to do something that's meaningful and that's going to be lasting. My goal isn't to play games that other people are playing. My goal isn't to try to be what other people are trying to be. My goal is to be myself and to find out who I am and what I can do. The Almighty put all of us on earth with a mission. Our job is to figure out what that mission is and to do our best to achieve that mission. This is part of interiority, but there's another aspect that I want to discuss, and that is a sensitivity to holiness. Now, what does that mean? Among many Sephardim, it was customary to read the Zohar, Book of Kabbalah. Now, I will be willing to bet any amount of money that the vast majority of people who read the Zohar had no clue what the Zohar was saying. It's a very difficult book, very esoteric. The average laborer, peddler, the hard worker of the Sephardim, the Chamalim of the Sephardim, they, they're the Zohar without any real understanding of what it was all about. Certainly not the deeper meanings, probably couldn't even translate the words, but they read it. So a question came to the Chida, Chaim Yosef David Azulai, who was a great rabbi in the 1700s. And someone asked the question, Rabbi, why is it important for all these Jews to be reading the Zohar? They don't even understand it. They don't even pronounce the words correctly. Why, why is that important? So the Chida answered very, very brilliantly. He said, you know, when those people are reading the Zohar, even if they don't understand a word, even if they mispronounce every word, they're in touch with something holy. They know that there's something sacred in the world, something beyond them. And even though they might not understand literally what's there, the emotion comes to them. And he said, it's the holiest thing when people are sitting out of pure piety to read the Hilim or read Zohar, even without understanding what they're saying, they're speaking a different language. It's not the language of the intellect, it's the language of the soul. And the language of the soul is also a language. And therefore, we have to understand that people, even if they look like they're simple workers or, or simple women who don't have much education, they have a sense of holiness, a sense that their life means something, a sense of something transcendent. There's already something that they're living a more elevated level. And even though on the external surface, they look like they're just nobodies, inside they're somebodies. We talked about this a bit last week also with the, the, the tikkun olam principle that was developed by Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, the tikkun olam idea was that whenever you did a misvah, you were in fact influencing the whole cosmos. It wasn't just a private deed between you and your friends and you and your family. It was something that had a cosmic impact. It made, so to speak, God happy. Somehow it fulfilled God's wish for humanity. So when you have that idea that whatever I'm doing actually has value that transcends my personal everyday life, you live on a different spiritual level. It's not, you don't just see the surface of the person. If you could go inside that person's soul, you see there's something alive there. There's something growing, something keen, something very, very fine. And that kind of spirit, that kind of kindling is what kept many of our DM proud, happy, and sense of holiness. It was customary in many communities for people to kiss the rabbi's hand and get the rabbi's blessing. The rabbis aren't saints, the rabbis aren't magicians. Kissing the rabbi's hand is not any better than kissing anybody else's hand. Why do they kiss the rabbi's hand? Not because he was the rabbi, because the rabbi symbolized something. 
in the eyes of the public, the rabbi symbolized a connection between themselves and the Almighty. In among the North African Jews, um, they have a, a custom of going to the graves of rabbis, they call Hilula. After the rabbi dies, they go to the grave and they have big parties and they went big prayers and a big shindig. Some people say, well, why do you go? Well, the rabbi's dead, How, what, isn't it superstitious? Okay, maybe if there's some superstition in it, I'm not gonna say no, but there's something else in it. What they're saying is, you know, if a person lived a righteous life and they die, their spirit didn't die. The righteousness that they represented in their life continues to have impact on us. Not because they're dead, they're gone, they're in the next world, fine. But the spirit, the ideas that they stood for are alive. And by going to the grave and celebrating in a sense, um, their lives and their deaths, the people who came there out of simple piety were really saying, God, righteousness lasts. We respect righteousness, we respect piety. Um, one of the great Moroccan rabbis who passed away some time ago was known as the Baba Sali, Rabbi Abu Hasera, he was known as the Baba Sali. Baba Sali, those words mean something. What do they mean? Baba Sali means our father who prays. Now, Sephardic rabbis are supposed to be learned, they're supposed to be kind, they're supposed to be nice, all kinds of good things. But they have to be able to pray. Baba Sali means you're our father who prays somehow or other, they get confidence that the rabbi had the ability to pray. He had a sacredness to him, a sanctity, a holiness. And the people looked at that with reverence, not because the rabbi is the only one who should pray, but as a model, we also can pray. We also can raise ourselves. When people live on that level, it's already not mundane. On the outside world, it may look like nothing, but inside world, there's something very, very strong and very powerful. So that's interiority or inwardness. I want to go to the next concept. And the concept is optimism, happiness, or balance in life. People always like to say when they have Sephardic festivals, they play music, they give a Sephardic food, they seldom remember we had brains. <laughs> they like all the exterior things that we do. They like the way we eat, they like the way we sing, they like the way we dance. They don't think that we have brains. We have brains too, don't worry. But when people talk about optimism, they focus on those parts of the Sephardic civilization which reflect happiness, and that's good. But I wanna go beyond just being happy. You could eat a meal and feel that the food is delicious and that's very satisfying and you feel like you're in a good mood. And that's, that's, all human beings feel that. But when Sephardim had a good meal, it wasn't that, only that. The food was terrific, no, no, no objection. And the music, phenomenal, no objection. It was more than that. And I give an example, the example of my childhood, Shabbat in the house of the angels. My mother, bless her memory, cooked a ton of food, the best food, wonderful food on Thursday and Friday. The house was always set up for Shabbat. We called Shabbat a Shabbat party. People come to the house. We had guests, cousins, uncles, aunts, people in the house all day long. When we ate a meal, yeah, the food was phenomenal. And we sang beautiful songs, heartfelt songs, gorgeous. But it wasn't just that. It was family, it was solidarity, and it was in a context of religiosity. It's Shabbat, Shabbat's a special day, or holidays, these are special days. This kind of feeling is, I call it the language of the soul. It's not just food, it's not just song. It's a combination of food and song with a higher goal. Goal is to celebrate the, goal, the greatness of God, the greatness of our tradition, the greatness of Torah. That was what we had from uh, Shabbat. So when I, we used to uh, bring my children, when we used to, I live in New York, so we used to go in the summertime to Seattle, we used to bring my children there. Our children always called it a Shabbat party. No, no, you make the best Shabbat party. And my mother was a, like a queen, she was so radiant with happiness and she cooked tremendously. But it, it's not just that our food is tasty and beautiful and, and we sing nice songs, those are, those are important things, but there's a purpose for it. It was in a context. And that context is something that I think needs to be emphasized. I mentioned also the uh, custom that we have of um, when a, one of our older relatives gets called to the Torah, we stand up in honor of the older relative. So my grandfather, Romy, may he rest in peace. He had 20 grandchildren. He had daughters, he had sons, he had sons-in-law, sons-in-law, grandchildren. When he would get called to the Torah, 
we would all stand up for him. What does that mean? Here is a person who's a barber who could hardly make a living, who could hardly provide food for his family, a person who didn't graduate from Harvard, and a whole bunch of people stand up for him in honor. Then when he got back to his seat afterwards, we all got lined up in order of our ages and kissed his hand and he gave us a bracha, gave us his blessing. He was a prince for that moment. He was validated, it was kavod. I'm somebody, my life means something. I have children, I have grandchildren. These people care about me. These people honor me. B'chavod, you get called the top Mr. Romy, b'chavod papu. Okay, so these are important things. I wanna carry out that idea a little bit further. And that is the uh, love songs. So we have this wonderful tradition of, of romances, beautiful lo love, love songs. And the most pious people sing love songs also. Um, how could religious people sing songs about love, passion, adultery, all kinds of things which, you know, other people who think who are religious might think are a little off the, off the beaten path. The answer is also, I call it happiness, but unnaturalness. Life for the Sephardim historically, and should be today also, is natural. Everything is included. Love is part of life. Women are part of life. Men are part of life. Your emotions are part of life. Everything that's human also belongs to us. I want to go back to the, the idea of happiness. When I was uh, in yeshiva, in, uh, I came to New York. So the, the, I had friends, of course, most of them were all Ashkenazim in those days. So one Shabbat, one of my friends invited me to his house to spend Shabbat in Brooklyn. And they took me to see. So we have a great, chaz, a great chazan in our shul. Okay. So he went to the shul and the chazan was singing. Very nice chazan, beautiful chazan, beautiful voice. And that happened to be a Shabbat where they have, they call it Shabbat Mavorchim, where it's a Shabbat before Rosh Chodesh. The chazan singing away, he's singing for Chayim shall shalom, chayim shall tobo, chayim shall brocha. What is he prayer singing? I want a life of, please God, give us a life of peace, a life of blessing, a life of prosperity. And he's crying. Okay. And I'm thinking back in our community in Seattle, and it's common all over Mongolia so far, pretty much. When we said salichot, we say a prayer, chatanu lefanecha, rachem alene. We come before God. God, we have sinned before you. Forgive us. It's a sad song, right? How do we sing it? You can all sing it with me. It's like a hoot nanny. People sing on the top of their lungs. We've sinned, God, and we're, forgive us. Just a second. If we're singing about that we're sinning, that we're sinning, how about being more contrite? We should be crying. The Chazan who's Ashkenazic is singing about beautiful things and he's crying. We're singing about sins and we're happy. There's a philosophy to that. Philosophy, Ashkenazim have their philosophy. We have our philosophy. Our philosophy is when we come before God, we come before our loving parents. Yes, we've done sins, we're sorry, we've made mistakes. But you know, a loving parent forgives sins. A loving parent wants us to come back and ask for forgiveness. That's what our attitude is. God is not an old man with a big stick waiting to hit us. God is a loving parent. God is someone who want, God is a being who wants us to live our best possible lives, to be fulfilled, to be happy, to be complete. And God wants us, our repentance is a way of making ourselves better and coming before God and saying we want to be better. But we do so in a spirit of optimism. I'll go to another thing. I call it gracefulness and good manners. Gracefulness and good manners, of course, everyone has good manners. Everyone eats nicely. Everyone walks nicely. Everyone says, please, and everyone says, thank you. These are very good things. Everyone should do that. However, it goes beyond that. It's beyond the surface here. I want to get to the inner life, what motivates things. And I'll give an example of uh, some of the things that I saw in my childhood growing up in Seattle. And uh, I actually mentioned this at the talk today at Comforad. The women in those days, my mother's generation, very few of them worked out of the home. Most of them worked very hard, raising their children, cooking, cleaning, taking care of their husbands. That was a very big job. They had big families, Baruch Hashem. And that was a pretty full, pretty full filling job for them. They didn't work for outside of stores. But once in a while, pretty regularly actually, they wanted to have some kind of social context. So they had what they call vijitas. Vijitas mean my mother would get on the phone, she'd call up her mother, she'd call up her aunties, she'd call up her sisters, some friends, 
come to my house Tuesday afternoon, Wednesday afternoon, nothing special for visita, it's a visit. Okay, so my mother would cook and bake everything. She would never use paper plates, shalom. She would never buy store cut uh, bakery bought stuff. She'd make everything herself. She set the table as if uh, the, the royalty of the world is coming. And then all the women would come, but all dressed in their Shabbat clothes. They're all dressed very beautifully. There's no special occasion. It's just Tuesday, Wednesday, it's a tea, it's, cup, it's informal. It's called honor. You come, there's dignity, comporto. There's a way to comport yourself. There's a way to respect yourself. There's a way to respect others. And everything had a certain social um, system that people knew how to behave themselves, how to, how to conduct themselves in a proper, in a proper manner. So um, there was a custom. Let's say you want the party came to a conclusion. You want people to go home. You know, they've been there long enough. It's time to go home. But you can't tell people, okay, folks, time to go home. It's not good manners. So they had a custom. It was in Seattle, maybe in other places too. But they used to serve a marzipan cookie called masapanes or a marzipan kind of cookie. And once a person got that cookie, they knew that that was time to go. That was a sign to go. They used to call it a pasaporto. Once you received that cookie, it meant as a passport. Oh, I'm very tired. Thank you for the beautiful lunch. Thank you for the beautiful party. Time to go. These are little things that reflect a, a certain elegance. Here are the simplest people, poor, untrained, unrefined in many ways, very refined, very sensitive to the needs of others, very sensitive to the feelings of others. Gracefulness to good, good manners just doesn't mean that we're neat and clean and polite. It also reflects something larger, it reflects a concern for society at large. You wanna be a good citizen, you wanna be a responsible citizen. So some of our greatest writers um, in the last century, Eliyahu Ben Amozeg, he died in the early 1900s, or 1900 actually he died, or by Uziel, other, other writers and thinkers, they emphasized ethics, this, the area of responsibility towards others. We live our lives not just to satisfy our own particular needs, but out of social sense of responsibility, being a good citizen, being a yachid, being a member of the synagogue, being a member of the community, and taking it responsibly. There was a very famous German philosopher, Franz Rosenzweig, and uh, one time or other, he was visiting a community in Yugoslavia, and he stayed among Sephardim. And the Sephardim, he, and he wrote in his diary about his experience among Sephardim. And he said, you know, the people that I was with, at home they spoke Judeo-Spanish, but they also knew French, they knew other languages. They weren't particularly learned in uh, Hebrew sub subjects. They weren't, didn't know about much about philosophy. But one thing I could say, they were Jewish in a very natural way. Oh, I think it's a wonderful compliment. They were Jewish in a very natural way. It wasn't imposed on them. It wasn't a burden on them. It was a way of life. It was natural. And I think that's one of the great strengths which we have in the Sephardic tradition. Today, when people say, oh, he's religious, you think, oh, he must be an extreme nut. He's way off on the, off on the tangent. He's very extreme, he wears a black hat, black coat. He uh, takes every possible stringency. That's religious. No, that's a, for Sephardim, historically, that it hasn't been what religious is. Religious is something different. Religious is, I'm living my life conscious of the fact that I'm in the presence of God and that I am answerable to God. I'm not answerable to my neighbor. I'm not answerable to the other rabbi. I'm not answerable to anybody else. I'm answerable to the Almighty, ultimately to my own conscience. This is a different kind of sensitivity. This is a sensitivity that teaches us self-respect, respect for others, and a natural way of religion. Sometimes people think, well, to be religious, you should only study the Torah. There is such a theory. I'm not going to knock it. But let people do whatever they want. But it's not my theory. God gave us the ability not only to be Jews, he gave us the ability to be human beings. Human beings are interested or should be interested in all aspects of life, science, philosophy, geography, different cultures, whatever there is, so we're in literature. It all belongs to us like to every other human being. Why should we lock ourselves out of it? On the contrary, to fulfill ourselves as Jews, we have to fulfill ourselves as human beings also. And this I think had been true historically among Sephardim. We lost it. I can't say that we always carried it. I can't say that all Sephardim had this philosophy, 
But that thread carried through the generations that we're responsible for and we have connection with everything in the world. I'll give an example. When the found, Israel, state of Israel was founded, there was an uh, ethnologist named uh, Dr. Raphael Patai, very famous but author of different books. And he wanted to start this society for ethnology, studying the different customs and traditions of all the different groups of Jewish people from throughout the world, all the heritage, all the traditions. So he thought in order to get a good start, he would go to the chief rabbis. So he went first to the Ashkenazic chief rabbi, Rabbi Herzog, who was a very great man. Don't take anything away from Rabbi Herzog. He was a magnificent, great man. But Rabbi pa this Dr. Patai wrote an article, and he's describing, I'm not, I'm not making this up, it's Dr. Patai's comments. He said he went into this office and he sees many, many books, all books of Torah, books of Halakha, books of Jewish studies, Jewish life, Jewish uh, commentaries. And then he discussed with the Rabbi Herzog his desire to start this, this uh, society of ethnology, Jewish ethnology. And Rabbi Herzog was a very polite man, very educated man. And he listened very politely and that was the end of the meeting. Dr. Patai realized that it wasn't really not Rabbi Herzog's cup of tea. So he went the next day, or soon thereafter, he went to the Sephardic chief rabbi, Rabbi Ben Sion Uziel. And he said, Rabbi Uziel, he's here to, he, he wants to start this uh, division of ethnology, this organization to study all the different Jewish traditions. And he also noticed that Rabbi Uziel's bookshelves, there are books in French, there are also books in Talmud and books in Halakha, books in Torah, commentaries, but there are books on history, some music, different things. Right away, he gets a, there's a, just, just from the bookshelf, you can see there's a different spirit here. When he asked Dr. Rabbi Uziel about the ethnology, Rabbi Uziel was lit up with excitement. Oh, that's a wonderful idea. I want you to make me the honorary president. I love it. And please make sure you collect all the Ladino folk songs too, the love songs. The chief Rabbi of Israel is asking to collect love songs? Yes. Why? Love is also part of life. Love is also part of Judaism. We're human beings. As human beings, we have to feel the whole width and breadth of Jewish, of human experience. So this is what he found in his uh, experience, Dr. Patai found. And I, I don't wanna make fast generalizations just because of that example, but it points us in a certain direction, which lets us know. The chief rabbi of the island of Rhodes in the early 20th century was Rabbi Reuven Eliyahu Yisrael. We have pictures of him. He's, wears a nice cream, long cream gown, he has a big long white beard, big hat, oh, very horribly looking man. And he wrote a perush, a, a translation and a commentary on Pirkei Avot, the Ethics of the Fathers, and he wrote it in Ladino. So when I was doing my book on the Jews of Rhodes way back when, that's my first book. So I found this, this um, book of Rabbi, Rabbi um, Ruven Eli Israel, and I read it with great interest. In the back, of the book, he has different poems and different ideas. In one section, he has advice to men how to get along with women. What? A chief rabbi of Island of Rhodes writing a book, a rabbinic book, and he's giving advice to men how to get along with women? I don't say the advice is good. <laughs> some of it may be better, some of it may be worse. It doesn't even matter. What matters is he thought it was perfectly natural. There was no second guessing it. There was no feeling, is this religious, not religious? I'm the chief rabbi. People are concerned about um, love and marriage. I'll give them my advice. Uh, you don't find that to be in mother traditions. And in fact, if a rabbi today would say that, they would consider him not to be orthodox. He's not, not religious enough. But for Sephardim, our idea of religion was different. Our idea of, of religion was, it wasn't God didn't give us religion as a burden. God gave us religion as a privilege. He didn't give us his vote to make us work hard. He gave us mitzvot to liberate us. Everyone has to find some kind of rootedness in life. So everyone has their own way. Everyone has their, they have their own traditions, their own life. Let them all live and be well. But if God chose us for whatever reason, in his infinite wisdom, he gave the Jewish people the Torah. And we gave it a Sephardic flavor. Through our experience, that Sephardic flavor helps us be who we are. It helps us to be stronger, deeper, more independent people. It helps us to be broad-minded. Sephardim in general, not all, we're not all such nice people, but in general, as a pattern, we didn't break into conservative, orthodox, reform, reconstructionist 
the Ashkenazim love to make groups, even Zionists. You can't be Jesus Zionist, you know, labor Zionist, religious Zionist, this Zionist, that Zionist. You have to have 15 uh, different parties. Chas Shalom, you should just try to be one thing. So I didn't, didn't have that attitude. So I said, you know what? We want a traditional structure. Individuals will do what they're gonna do. Some should observe more, some will observe less. We wish everyone would observe everything. But we don't judge people. It's God's business to judge people. We don't judge people. We want people to feel they're part of the kahal. We wanna be inclusive. So we don't ask, do you, did you drive to synagogue? Did you walk to synagogue? Did you eat something kasher? Did you eat something not kasher? Can I trust your standard? Do I not trust your standard? Do you have only halal of Israel? This is nuts. That's not the way you do things. Each individual makes a judgment based on what we learn, what we observe, what we feel. We try to observe the best way we can. And there's a ladder and we all try to climb as high as we can on our given ladder. But if someone's on this point of the ladder and another one's on that point, it's not our job to judge them. Our job is to love, to encourage and to keep the wholeness of the people, which I think is another part of the Sephardic genius historically. When I wrote the book of um, Foundations of Sephardic Spirituality, I wrote, I called it the inner life of the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. The exterior life was pretty lousy. There was poverty, they lived in crowded areas. There were some rich people, but by and large, they lived in very crowded neighborhoods, there was disease, 101 problems maybe 102, <laughs> well, they had problems. On the outside, a person coming from the outside who doesn't know anything about Judaism, doesn't know anything about these people, will say, here's an oppressed group, here they're in a ghetto, they're, low, they're, they're very lowly, they're of poor economic level, they have no political power, these are losers. No, they weren't losers. Those people are lives winners. By your standards, we we're losers, but by our own standards, we're winners. Our lives mean something. Our lives are lived in a context. The context isn't you. The context is between me and God. The context is me and our community having a sense of solidarity, a sense of unity, a sense of coming before God. We've sinned before you, God, but we sing it out. Because why? Because God loves us. Because there's a happiness in our lives. On the outside, people don't see that. On the inside, there's something very powerful. And that was what was transmitted generation by generation over all those hard, difficult generations of uh, our people. So that I think the legacy they left both in the intellectual and on the folk level have great value. I, I, I don't think it's important for my great, 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 great grandchildren to be Sephardic. I'm not an ethnic Sephardic Jew anymore. I, I, I'm very proud of being Sephardic. I, I, I love it. But I, I, don't, I consider Sephardism more important than Sephardic ethnicity. I think the ideas of Sephardic, the best that we can draw out of our tradition, I want my great, great, great grandchildren to be able to draw on that also. I want them to feel integrity. I want them to feel wholeness. I want them to feel comfortable with the world. I want them to feel natural as human beings and natural as Jews. I don't want them to be an extreme this way or extreme that way. I want them to feel rooted, solid, happy, content. That's what I want. And I want them to live as Jews who were that, that Judaism is the impetus and the contributor to giving them all those positive qualities that could give them a happy, full, and beautiful integrity life. I'm gonna stop here actually and see if anyone has questions, all right? Um, Ethan, you wanna take over and ask if we have any questions from anybody? So is this the end of the lecture? Do you wanna- I'm gonna stop here unless people have questions. I, I, I can always add more, but I'd like to have questions. For sure, absolutely. As always, um, so if anybody has any questions for um, Angel, please uh, enter them to the chat and we're going to read them out as we go along. Uh, Rabbi, I have a question for me um, in terms of the context you were speaking about, about kind of this beauty of this, this beauty of Sephardic life as you were speaking about in the sense that people, at least in my generation, people in the wider Jewish world don't recognize beyond just the biscochos and baklava and the music, as you mentioned, they don't recognize the deeper meaning of the Sephardic ideology, the philosophy, the beauty of living and being a Sephardic Jew. How do we kind of express this and engage in saying, wait a minute, we're much more than just biscochos and baklava. We're so much more than just food or songs. We have this beautiful way of thinking, this beautiful way of learning, this beautiful way of living that can really be a model for all of Judaism. 
Well, that's what you try to do through the Sephardic Brotherhood. And that's what I try to do through my institute. And that's what other people are trying to do. We're trying to give people the context of these things. I'm, I'm never going to say anything against delicious food. I love delicious food. I remember my, 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 my mother, my auntie, my grandma, wonderful, wonderful cooks. Uh, my, my wife is a wonderful cook. She became a good Sephardic cook too. She wrote a Sephardic cookbook. So I'm not, no, no criticism of cooking whatsoever. It's beautiful as well. But what I'm trying to emphasize is if you just want a culture to survive and you can give people good food and good songs, it, it, to us it's emotionally very valuable. And to another generation it might be, but three, four generations from now, it won't mean anything to them. They couldn't care less. It's good to that. The Chinese food is the same thing. They're all good. The reason when I eat a boreka, it's good, isn't because it tastes good. I eat a boreka good because I hear my grandma, I taste my grandmother's boreka. I take my mother's boreka. I, I feel the whole civilization that the boreka represents. So in order to convey something, we have to believe it in ourselves. One of the problems that we have in Sephardic life today, okay, take a little bit of a side here, is that there's a general diminution of religious observance in a serious way on one, on one side. And people think, you know, I show up to synagogue once a year, once a two years, and it, it, it's too much of a burden, I'm not interested. Okay, you know, God bless them. And I'm, I'm not judging them. But you can't transmit Judaism that way. And you certainly can't transmit a Sephardic Judaism that way. Three generations down the line, if not sooner, your, your kids and grandkids are not going to marry Sephardim. But then I may not marry Jews altogether. It's a very complicated thing what's going to happen in the coming generations. The ethnic, ethnic aspect is going to disappear in the course of time. So in order to make life really meaningful, we have to make people realize Shabbat is a, a, a gift, not a burden. Shabbat is a party, not a, a pain. And, and unless we ourselves are able to convey that to our children, it's gonna be very hard to convey it to the next generation. So I, the foundation of Sephardic life has to be, in my humble opinion, based on a very strong religious family basis. But on the other side, some people are drifting away. Other people are drifting to the other side, becoming more Ashkenazized or Haredized, as I say. You see Sephardic rabbis, Sephardic yeshiva students with black hats, black coats. They, they think like, they act like, Ashkenazim, God bless Ashkenazim, no complaint. But each of us, each of our traditions has something to contribute to the kitty. And it's a mistake for Judaism if we only have one direction. Years ago in 1990, I was president of the Rabbinical Council of America. So I was a big shot in those days. So I went to the uh, Sephardic chief rabbi, right? Mordechai Eliyahu, Allah was shalom, he's a great man, wonderful man. And I said to Rabbi Eliyahu, I'm very concerned that the Sephardim are losing their identity. Whenever you have something in Israel about Sephardim, it's always about uh, food and about music, and that's the end of it. And why is it that all the Sephardic rabbis that I see, they all dress exactly like they grew up in Poland? We need Sephardim with a kippah, we need Sephardim with a black hat, we need Sephardim with a white hat, we need Sephardim with a, with a red shirt, we need Sephardim who are hippies, we need rabbis, all kinds of rabbis, play guitar, we need all kinds of rabbis. We shouldn't just be one model. He says, Rabbi Angel, we already lost that war. In order to be a Talmud Chacham in Israel, you have to dress like the Ashkenazim, period. There's nothing more to discuss. Only the Rishon Lezion can wear his fancy outfit. All the other Sephardic rabbis have to dress like Ashkenazim. That's the uniform of rabbis. And if you don't dress like that, you're not taken seriously. I said, there shouldn't be only one road. Because if we want to appeal to the broader masses, the, bra the broader group of Israelis or Jews in general, they, they need different entryways. Everyone's not ready to become a Haredi Jew. Everyone's not interested in joining a Hasidic cult. We need different avenues where people can find at their own comfort level and come in. So you need different kinds of rabbis, different kinds of spiritual leaders from different traditions. And unless we each can contribute something of our own, the whole public loses. And he says, well, it's, he started laughing at me. It's too late, That's, it's all gone. Well, I don't want it to be gone. Maybe I'm Don Quixote, maybe, maybe it is gone. But if it's gone, the tragedy isn't to Sephardim. The tragedy is to the Jewish people as a whole. Because why should the Jewish people as, as a whole be deprived of this very important segment of civil, Jewish civilization? Like, let's, say, let's say, for example, we just simply erase from Jewish history all the Hasidim. There's no more Baal Shem Tov, there's no more Levi Yitzhak Bardichev, there's no more Kotzka Rebbe. We would all be poor. They were great men. They had great teachings. I'm not a Hasid. I won't follow them in full. But that doesn't mean I can't learn from them. I'm not, I'm proud to have learned from them. The Gaon of Vilna, there are so many different people, Ashkenazic and Sephardic, Shalom Aleichem, Yiddish literature. There's so many things that were contributed to the whole people of Israel. Why should I be deprived from that? Just as we shouldn't be deprived of those things, 
they shouldn't be deprived of our stuff. And if they're not getting our stuff, it's because we're not teaching it well enough because we ourselves are imploded culturally. And we ourselves, when we have a Sephardic night, it's always with good food and good songs and that's the end of it. We don't emphasize that we also have brains and something to teach the public. So that's, that's our challenge. Important question here, technical question. Is there a book uh, we can read and what you just spoke about tonight? Yes, I happened to write the book. <laughs> Foundations as far as spirituality, the inner life of the Jews of the Ottoman Empire. You can get it through my institute or you can get it on, uh, on, uh, online through Barnes and Noble or through Amazon. Uh, another question here, how do, we, how do uh, Sephardim separate morality from ethics? It, it, you know what, it, philosophers make a very fine distinction between morality and ethics. I don't, all the books I've read on it, I still don't understand the difference. <laughs> I, I don't know if the words are, are interchangeable or not. So I'm not even gonna comment on it, I don't know. Uh, can you speak more on connecting to our creator through the creation as it relates to Sephardic spirituality? as in the Sephardic method to, to connect to God? I, I don't know if it's the Sephardic approach, but I know there are a variety of Sephardic approaches. One way I mentioned before is through, through prayer. In our, in classic, classically, I'm not saying it works in every synagogue, but classically when Sephardim go to synagogue, they pray with great emotion. The song, the Chazan reads almost everything out loud. The Kahal sings a lot. There's a feeling of community harmony. Now. There are two kinds of prayer. One kind of prayer is in the synagogue where we feel uh, Kahal singing together. It's, it's really very, very inspiring, very happy, I would say, very happy. But there's a second kind of prayer, just our own selves, privately. The Kabbalists emphasize a principle called Hit Bodidut. Hit Bodidut, Arya Kaplan translated as meditation. It doesn't necessarily mean technically this, this, the skills of meditation as is practiced today by in Eastern religions, but it means each of us needs one hour a day where we could just think, where we're not in a rut, where we're not forced, where we don't have to answer any phones, and there's no one zooming at us, and there's no one calling us, and no one's, no one's on our backs. Just one hour a day, even half an hour today, where we could just think and try to put our life in context. That's also prayer. That's also spirituality. The Rabbi Eliezer Papo, who wrote the Peleoets, a great, great Musar book, I think I discussed it last week, Rabbi Papo said, sometimes people say, well, during the day I'm busy working and I'm eating and I have a meeting and I don't have time to, to think. I don't, who has time to, to think these days? So he says, you know what? In the middle of the night you wake up, there's no one's gonna bother, no one even knows you're awake. <laughs> you have half an hour, the lights are off, everyone's in the house is sleeping. You have one half hour freedom all by yourself. Say a, a, a tea thing by yourself. Say words of prayer of your own words, in your own language. Pour out your heart. What's important to you? What's not important to you? Speak to God as though God actually listens. Speak to God as though God has a presence in your life. And when you do that, eventually, when you first start doing that, it might seem very artificial. In the course of time, it becomes more natural. And that, I think, is a, a, another key to what we may call Sephardic spirituality. Sometimes the word spirituality is a mysterious word. People think of mystery, spirituality is, you know, you have to be a little bit of a nut, you have to be a little bit of a mystic. No, you can be spiritual. You look at the sunset, you can be spiritual too. You look at a beautiful mountain, Mount Rainier in Seattle. Oh, the Indian side of Mount Rainier was a, a holy. You know what? It is holy in its own way. There's something that carries you out of yourself. And instead of repressing ourselves, we should open ourselves to that. That's why I think um, one of the things that's been important to me, I think, I think it's because of, of my Sephardic mushugas, to use an Ashkenazic word, is I, I read many books, not on Judaism. I spent the week with, with Sioux Indians on a Sioux Indian tribe in South Dakota. I read, I think, many, many books on Eastern religion. I read many books on Christianity and on Islam. Of course, I read mostly about Judaism. But each of these traditions are people searching for God. They're all searching for some universal truth. And if our minds are open to that, it enlarges us. It enlarges us. Okay. Another question here. Is it a misconception that because of um, 
of rabbis and their in their learnedness and their knowledge in general that they're closer to God or this path um, that we're all supposed to be on. I think if anyone thinks rabbis are closer to God, they have a, a mistaken notion. They're, they're not just because you get a smicha doesn't mean you're closer to God. I can guarantee that. Uh, there are people who happen to be rabbis who are extremely spiritual and in fact feel are godly people. And there are other people who are merchants and bankers and scientists who are equally spiritual people. It's not, the, the, the rabbis don't have monopoly. And I, I would say to a certain extent, rabbis have a handicap. The handicap is it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to be who you are. When I first became a rabbi um, in Sherath Israel, they have a custom they have a custom, to, the rabbis wear a gown and a hat, a special kind of hat. It goes back to colonial days. And I was a hippie. I mean, I grew up in the 1960s. I was not a, uh, I didn't even own a hat when I came to share with Israel. I've, I'm not a hippie, okay, it's a little exaggeration. But I grew up in the 60s, I had a different view on things. And certainly wearing a gown and hat was not my cup of tea at all. But uh, it was a job, I had to wear it. And when I wore it, I used to tell myself, Angel, don't ever become this cap and gown. Don't ever become this cap and gown. Be yourself. Don't let this define who you are. The public, they see your cap and gown and you're already a stereotyped. They don't see in your, they don't see in your, your inside. They don't see if you're a person. They don't see if you're struggling or thinking or feeling. You're the rabbi. You're rabbi, you know everything. You know the, you know, you know the whole Torah, you know everything. You don't have these conflicts. You just believe in God, you're safe. Forget about it. We're not gowns and we're not caps. We're not outside. People expect, they think because the rabbi has a title, that somehow that opens all the doors. On the contrary, sometimes it makes it worse for the rabbi because rabbi is living, instead of being himself, he's trying to live up to what other people expect him to be. And when you try to live your life according to what other people expect you to be, your life is gonna be a failure. Yes, we can't be you know, just free willing with, and disregard how other people feel about us, but ultimately we cannot live our lives letting other people define who we are. Once we do that, it's over, the game is over. You become fakes. Once you become a fake, you certainly should not be a rabbi. You're, you're a very poor human being. Question here in the chat. Are Sephardic customs, such as naming after living relatives, in danger of being lost in Israel because of Ashkenazic influence and kind of expanding that? Is that a danger to be lost in the United States because of the Ashkenazic influence? The answer is yes and no. The answer is yes, it's, there's a danger of losing this particular custom. And the other answer is no, they actually, Ashkenazim who learn about it, they like it. I, I know many Ashkenazim who, who, are, who are, have changed their custom and they, they say, you know, why shouldn't our kids be named our, our grandchildren be named after us? It's a wonderful glory to have grandchildren named after us. It's beautiful. So it's changing. I can't predict how it's gonna be uh, in a hundred years from now. I don't know. Um, but it's a really beautiful custom and it's very um, special. Uh, and look, I, I speak personally. First of all, I, I knew my grandfather, Romy. I was named after him. I had a number of cousins also in Mordechai. There's a certain fa family solidarity. You know where you belong in the pecking order in your family. And I have a couple of grandsons named after me. I love it. My wife is Ashkenazic by birth. She has a granddaughter named after her. She loves it. <laughs> She's very happy with it. Um, so the most important thing is our children and grandchildren should be happy and strong and good. Whatever they name their kids, God bless them. Just let them be good Jews and good people. Uh, let's see here, just think for one, two more questions and then we'll wrap up here. Um, there's a question about, um, in the spirit of Sephardic Judaism and the embrace of innovation, do you see a time, you know, in light of the coronavirus and everything else, um, where Zoom is used to facilitate um, issues like immersion or things like Limud Torah or Minyan or Hupa or other um, things that require Minyan or require a physical presence? I think it's, it's the, uh, the Zoom thing is a, a, a new challenge. And some, I, there were some Moroccan rabbis who wrote before Pesach, they could have a Zoom Seder. They permitted using the Zoom for Seder, which I think was brilliant. And most Ashkenazim came out against it, but, but the Sephardim thought it was very, it was very, very important, very well, very well argued. Um, I think we're still trying to figure all these things out. I don't think we have an answer to it. And like many conflicts, many problems in life, there's gonna be this opinion, that opinion, and it eventually um, it takes a while before it actually a consensus emerges. So this is gonna, it's gonna take us uh, 10 years before we really figure out what to do with Zoom. And so sometimes, some rabbis are gonna be more liberal, some rabbis are gonna be stricter. 
It's gonna take a while before there's a consensus reached. Uh, next week, by the way, we're gonna speak about the, the response and the teachings of Rabbi Benzion Uziel. And we're gonna talk about Sephardic Halakha in general. And I'm gonna talk about Rabbi Uziel and also one of his great disciples, Rabbi Chaim David Halevi. I wrote books about both of them. So we're gonna talk about that whole thing and dealing with innovation changes. They were both traditionalists, but they both were very creative in their own ways. So we'll discuss that more at length next week. Great, I think that's all the questions for this evening. Um, unless there are any others, it doesn't look like in the chat. Um, but I wanna take a moment to thank Rabbi Angel again for a wonderful part three um, of his four part series. Like you mentioned, next week is the last week already. Uh, it's a kind of incredible how time flies um, for the series. Um, I wanna thank you all again for joining us this evening. We're back next week at Monday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, 4.30 p.m. Pacific. By the way, as Rabbi Angel said, if you're interested in getting more of this, if, if you want to see this sustain to the next generation, you know, I, I always say this in context, get involved with the Sephardic community. Make sure you get your young, you know, your children, your grandchildren, teach them about the Sephardic Shabbat traditions, bring them to a Shabbat dinner, bring them to synagogue, God willing, when we open one day and we're safe and healthy, but learn more about what we're doing in the Sephardic community and the Sephardic Brotherhood and other community institutions at the Institute for Jewish Ideas and Ideals and how we're trying to reinvent, um, in a sense, and bring back those Sephardic ideals um, to the next, next generation. So check out our website, SephardicBrother.com, check out JewishIdeas.org, and you can find all this wonderful content there as well. Rabbi Angel, thank you so much. Thank you very much and good night. Good night to everybody. Thank you for joining us.